Good afternoon and welcome to Slow Art Friday. My name is Christy McMillan. I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement here at the Asheville Art Museum and I am joined by Kay Dunn, our touring docent, who will be leading today's conversation. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple. Slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Kay will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each one. Kay will allow us time to look at each work on our own, slowly, before leading a conversation with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in, in dialogue with Kay, myself, and each other throughout the hour. As you got logged on, you probably noticed that your microphones and video were muted by default. Um, please feel free to turn on your video so that we can see who we're talking to. And in just a moment, I'll make it so that folks can unmute their microphones to participate in the conversation. Choose a quiet room and close the door. Silence any alerts from nearby devices. I just took my own advice. Try not to sit in front of a window, lamp, or other strong source of light or movement if you choose to turn on your video. Use headphones and microphone for best sound quality. While you can log in using a smartphone, we do recommend using a desktop, laptop, or tablet in order to see slides and meeting tools on a larger screen. Make sure that your screen name includes your first name and last initial, or first name and last name, again, so that we know who we're talking to. In order to ask questions or make comments during the program, you can unmute your microphone when Kay asks for questions or comments. You can also um, type any questions or comments that you have into the chat box. A third way to participate is to raise your hand in the participant sidebar, and uh, I will call on you and ask you to unmute your microphone. That method, the third method, sometimes takes a while um, for us to call on you, so I do just encourage you to jump into the conversation when, when you have a question or comment. Finally, we are recording, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure that your video and audio remain muted and use the chat box to submit any questions or comments. At this time, I'm going to make it so folks can unmute themselves. Please do leave your microphone muted unless you're actively asking a question or making a comment. Before we get started, does anybody have a question or comment? All right, Kay, what will we be talking about today? All right. Well, hello and thanks, Christy. And yes, welcome to Slow Art Friday. And my name is Kay Dunn, and I'll be your guide today as we look closely at um, three artworks from the Asheville Art Museum's collection. Um, I chose these artworks because they all have something to say to us, I think, about the theme of today's tour, which is the human spirit. As you'll see, or have probably already seen, they all have different things to say to us. So I'll be quite interested in your thoughts about that. So just a minute before we get started, if you would, just tell me what comes to mind when you think of the human spirit. Any words come to mind? I would say passion. Passion, okay. During the music that we were listening to as we were waiting for the program to start, I I just appreciated that simple message, life is beautiful. And I, I was thinking about that sort of life is what you make it. And if you go into it with optimism, um, then your spirit sort of helps you to perceive the world that way. Very good. On the yeah. other spectrum, I would say broken because I think that there's the two aspects of the human spirit. Okay, very good, broken. Yes, and I think as we look at these artworks, we'll see that full spectrum. And that's um, sort of, I think, what I wanted to get at when I tried to put together these, these particular three. Well, let's keep these ideas in mind as we look at these artworks, but also see uh, maybe what new ideas might occur to us and what new insights we might have as we go through them. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started then. 
uh, first artwork. Okay, well, let's take just a moment to look at this. Okay, what's going on in this artwork? Yeah, is Sandy, are you raising a hand? Well, I can tell you that I see a black man. I can't tell if he's nicely dressed or just robed, um, but he's chained and lying on his side. Uh, I, he has shoes on and um, his face is, I, I think his face is bewildered. Okay, a bewildered look on his face. All right, and you, you pointed out the chains which sort of start from his wrist and really, if you look all the way down, all the way to his feet are chained. You commented on his clothes. I'm not quite sure what he's wearing, but some sort of garment that seems to be sort of wrapped around him. All right. I know it's interesting. His hand is in a fist. It appears to be in a fist. And okay. I, yeah, and I would say this is um, an example of a broken spirit. You know, um, plus. I find the black and white to be dramatic. Um, although we can't tell what he's wearing. I think if this was in color, it wouldn't be as powerful for me. Really? Why, and why do, you, why do you think that? Because the black and white draws the emphasis to the, the tension, I think, that this person's feeling. Okay. All right. That's interesting. All right. And so, and you commented on his fist, one hand, definitely right there in front by his face is a fist. What about the other hand? What do you notice? I feel that the other hand almost looks surrendered. One hand looks like he's gonna fight and the other one looks like it's surrendered. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean there, yeah. So um, we've got sort of a contrast, I guess, in, in um, maybe what those are conveying. Um, how would you describe the mood of this artwork? I'd say tragic. It's a okay. tragic mood. Very what are, tense. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Very tense. Very tense, okay. Tragic and very tense. What are some of the elements of the artwork that sort of help to create that mood? We, you, someone had uh, talked about the black and white, but what are some, and do you notice anything else that helps create that? Well, it's the chains. I mean, clearly he's chained up by his hands and feet and that the head is tilted and the, the, the facial expression. Mm -hmm. Also the yeah. types of locks. I think that um, like in modern times, if you see someone chained, you, you think of like um, handcuffs that have their own sort of locking mechanism, but I'm seeing two sort of distinct locks, mm -hmm. one here mm -hmm. and one here, kind of like padlock type locks, which yeah. to me is incredibly aggressive and mm -hmm. oppressive. Interesting. Yes, I see what you're saying. The locks, they almost look like something you chain, a, you know, around an old trunk or chest or something, not, you know, in modern- A thing, things. certainly not a person or a living being. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, I see that. What about the artist's perspective in doing this? Where, where was the artist's um, eye, I guess? <laughs> I 
sort of on the level of on the, the level. Mm -hmm. So not looking down or um, even having the figure elevated on a platform or a bed or something, but right down there with the individual. Would you call that confrontational? The I would call it empathetic. <laughs> empathetic. Okay. I mean, personally, I mean, it, I mean, we even have that phrase in English, you know, on on the level or on someone getting on someone's level, which means that mm -hmm. you're trying to sort of make that connection with them. Um, or, you know, if you are talking to a child, you might, uh, you know, squat down or sort of get on your knees or sit down so that you can look at them eye to eye. That that was the thought that I had, Sandy, but you might have a different perspective. Oh, yes, I could see the captive, the um, just getting in his face and teasing him and harassing him and hate talk all around. Mm -hmm. Okay, what kind of, um, what kind of line do we see in this um, artwork? Or Definitely horizontal and diagonal. Okay. Some vertical. Mm -hmm. But it is it is sort of a elongated. I, I sort of noticed the the baseline there, um, going. Um, I guess the shadow of the figure going from one end to the other. So Micah Jean commented in the chat box that for her, this is really painful to view. Mm -hmm. Micah Jean, do you want to mm -hmm. unmute yourself and talk about why are you feeling it today? Um, hi, I just, no, <laughs> it's just, I mean, I'm kind of speechless. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. I don't know how to elaborate. Right. Well, let me let me ask you this. Um, if you don't already know when this artwork was completed, what would you guess? About what time period would you guess? Uh, two months ago. It could have been. I mean, that's sort of... Yeah. That's... I think one of the tragic aspects of it, we can't really say that it's far in the past. For me, this is Micah again. For me, um, thank goodness Afros are coming back, but the Afro, um, it kind of reminds me of the era of the Black Panther movement. So that would be late 60s through the seven, early 70s, I suppose. Okay, all right. All right, so um, what about, um, we haven't really talked about how the artist created this work, but what would you say? How do you think this was, um, what uh, technique, what method was used to create it? I don't know for sure, but when I was looking at this hand here in the foreground, well, it seems to have some natural texture to it. And I'm wondering if this might be a woodcut. That's so, what I'm thinking. Okay. A woodcut print, which I don't know. And maybe you can, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. And I was thinking about if it is a woodcut, that's something that's very time intensive to create because you're carving into the wood and carving the lines. And for the subject matter, it would make it so that the artist was spending a, a long time sort of contemplating the subject and creating the emotion of the scene, just physically, you know, making the plate to, to print. Mm -hmm. um, making it really sort of tangible and almost like a, a process of contemplation during the act of creation. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it, is, it would be a very, very long 
intensive process to dwell on this and sort of immerse yourself in it. I was wondering about the feet. We talked about the hands, like that one was in a fist, almost a fighting and the other surrender. The one foot is laying down, but the other foot almost looks like it's pushing up the far right one, like trying to get up or to lift. So it's almost like the juxtaposition, the fighting versus the surrendering. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, it reminds me of the Black Panther movement when they would raise their their arms and with the fist. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the label slide and see what that will tell us. Okay, the title is Homage to George Jackson by Antonio Frasconi. Um, and he created this in 1971. It is a woodcut, as we said. Now, who, can anyone tell us about George Jackson? Does anybody know his story? Well, he was imprisoned and he was also an activist while he was imprisoned. Exactly, that's right. And someone earlier, it may, might have been you, Laurel, mentioned the Black Panthers and he was, um, he was incarcerated in um, uh, San Quentin prison. And during that time, he became an activist, um, very outspoken about prison conditions. And he wrote a book, um, Soul Dad Brother. And um, he was shot to death by a tower guard in 1970 in what appeared to be um, an escape attempt. I read quite a bit about it and interesting, you know, even today there's, you can read all different viewpoints of this story. It, you know, 50 years later and it's still as raw as it was then in terms of people's impressions of it. Um, there were five hostage, hostages found dead in his cell after the incident, um, but a lot of controversy about the circumstances of his escape and uh, some viewing it as a justifiable homicide and some viewing it really as a political assassination. Uh, he was, as I mentioned, active or I'm not sure he was active because he was in prison, but he was certainly associated with black Panther movement. A little side note, um, what uh, another name that's sort of associated with this whole incident was Angela Davis. Um, during the hearing for his case, um, the um, his 17 year old 17 year old brother led a raid on the courthouse and was killed during the raid. And Angela Davis, I think, was instrumental in, in part of that as well. So it, it was definitely big headlines at the time. Um, I thought one of the things that struck me about reading about it was he was in prison originally at the age of 18 for stealing $70 from a gas station in Los Angeles. And he spent the next 10 years, most of that in solitary confinement uh, in Soldad prison and then was transferred to San Quentin when he and a couple of other inmates were accused of killing a, a prison guard. So I just thought, you know, his start as a teenager and being arrested for, yes, it was probably armed robbery, a lot of things you could say about it, but from that incident to really the tragedy of his life is just really um, very sad. Hey, how uh, old was he when he when he died? When he died, um, he must have been about in his late twenties, I would say. So still a very young man. Still a young man, right? Yeah. Uh, can I say an aside, because I have a daughter who teaches drama in the California State Prison, and she ha is a prison activist, and the background of all the prisoners is so tragic. It really is. Um, well, I'll have to say, this was a, 
an artwork I almost didn't include today because I really wanted us to have probably a more uplifting discussion about the human <laughs> spirit. But then as I started thinking about it, you know, as, as we said at the very beginning, it's the full spectrum. And um, I thought this one really um, was at that end of it where, you know, you have the brokenness. But maybe um, also... Can I just say, I, I want to thank you for bringing this this artwork, this piece to us, because we have to have these, I, mean, I don't mean to get too political here, but but I am. Um, we have to have these conversations as white people, mostly, I assume most here are white. Um, it's essential. And just a shout out to the new administration. Right. Right. He, he, healing is on the way. Yes. Can I just ask, um, Kay, was George Jackson chained when he was shot by the prison guards? No, I don't believe this was really um, supposed to portray him as, you know. Okay, so it's not trying to capture a scene, but do you, like, do you yeah, think that the chains yeah. are more symbolic? Probably more symbolic, although he was, um, like I said, he was in solitary at you know in San Quentin for or in, I guess it sold that for probably almost eight years so um there were you know who knows it was very possible part of that was you know he was changed during part of that it's just you know as I was saying earlier about the locks and how big the locks are and also you know the chains it's like double or triple you know what you might see on those sort of chains um, that are used to chain the the feet and hands of of a uh, um, person who's incarcerated. It it's overkill. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not using that word lightly. It's mm -hmm. it's as I said earlier, really aggressive and really oppressive. It's not just to keep someone from trying to, you know break free right way more than that it's um it's changing someone's spirit you know it's bringing them down mm -hmm. literally but also figuratively metaphorically i guess modern day slavery mm -hmm. right yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely micah thank you because the chains that are depicted here are much more reminiscent of a 19th century sort of hand forged chains than ones that are used in the 20th century um, policing. So yeah, that you're absolutely right. It makes me think of that. It, it just seems so heavy to me. Mm -hmm. It really does. Well, let me tell you a little about the artist Antonio Frasconi. He was um, born in Argentina in 1919. He's American, but um, he grew up in, um, actually in um, Uruguay. I think he, his parents moved there. He was an artist, a teacher, and um, recognized really for his wood woodcuts. Um, he also wrote children books. Here's a little fun fact about him. In 1955, he wrote and illustrated a children's book, See and Say a picture book in four languages. And he wrote that um, because he couldn't find any good bilingual books for his children. It was in English, French, Italian, and Spanish. Um, he started early as a teenager drawing political cartoons. Um, his, he moved to the United States in 1945 to study art. And then by 1953, Time Magazine had was calling him American, America's foremost practitioner of the art of the woodcut. And he's really had, I think, a considerable influence on that art in this country, or had uh, considerable influence on it. Um, he said about woodcutting, sometimes the wood gives you a break and matches your conception of the way it is grained, but often you must surrender to the grain, find the movement of the scene, the mood of the work, in the way the grain runs. Mm. I thought that was really interesting looking at this and his particularly like the shin, you know, right there in front and it almost looks scabbed or whatever. And that's just how the wood, I guess, 
was at that particular point, but it really is just some sort of amazing, the texture in the hands and everything. Um, he's a lot, of, m most of his works are um, reflective of, um, you know, or address war, racism, and poverty. Um, he uh, did a lot of work about the people who were tortured and killed in his home country, um, and also works about Vietnam and, and uh, protest here. Um, on his choice of subject matter, I have another quote. He says, um, a sort of anger builds in you, so you try to spill it back in your work. And um, so I think, you know, obviously that's, that's uh, what we're seeing here. Um, you ask if he's still alive. No, he passed away in 2013. All right. Any more comments or questions on this before we move on? Okay, well, let's go on to our second artwork. And again, I'll give you just a, a moment to take a look at this one. Okay, so what's going on in this artwork? It, it's Micah. Um, it's a lot to take in. I mean, there's so much detail. And I see a person of color in the center. Mm -hmm. And then this, this colorful, almost butterfly type wings. Mm -hmm. And what all the other okay. pieces seem botanical somehow. Okay. What do you, okay, so let me just sort of uh, play that back, I guess. Um, it, we have a figure in the center. It looks like to be a person of color. And then from the sides, I think you, everybody can see the um, almost wing-like structure, sort of feathery kind of structures with colors. And then you mentioned how detailed it was, and you're seeing a lot of um, little figures. What what do you see in that? What what are people seeing in those figures? I see lots of flowers. Okay. I see, I see flowers and I see clenched fists. Huh. Oh. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. So we have a similar thing from the first, but is this how is the feeling of these um, fists different or the same um, from the first work we looked at? Mm. Yes, anybody? Well, somebody said, you know, they look like butterfly wings on the side. And that is, I think, because of the yeah. color and mm. the, the pattern. Oh, yeah. And then the edges of those wings are clenched fists. Clenched fists, uh-huh. I see uh -huh. that if you look very closely. Isn't that beautiful? All that detail. I'd like to, wow. <laughs> to add, when I see this, these fists compared to the previous artists, um, these fists seem to be less, there seems to be less anguish, um, more, um, somewhat at peace. Okay. The, even though the, it's the... Yeah, not not clinched in <laughs> the in the strife and difficulty um, that the previous um, character was portrayed in. Okay. Yeah, so there, it, there's it's sort of clinching more softly. There's not sort of the curl of the fingers that make it really urgent, but. It's just sort of laying your hand. It's very like graceful or elegant mm -hmm. gesture. Mm -hmm. Is that what you meant, Terry? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyone by the light, else? By the light, there's like a circle of light around um, the where the mm -hmm. yes, and it almost looks to me like the figure in the center is moving forward, walking, but yet this upside down head almost looks like 
a reflection and a skeleton to me. It, it's kind hmm. of uh, interesting. I think, it is. I think he's transcending. Huh. I think he's walking on water and transcending to another life, maybe a better life. Aren't we? So we have a reflection and a perhaps a reflection on water, but a, a feeling of transcendency, maybe of um, moving from one place to another. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the lower, the ref, in the reflection, that the head down there is a little different, maybe a skull like appearance. It's a little hard to mm -hmm. see. But it's definitely different from the man's head up above. Any thoughts? A little, it's, it's just so amazing. And I love when you magnify and show us um, more detail um, because um, the face is facing towards us, but it looks like the body is going in the opposite direction. And then, of course, the reflection down at the bottom does seem uh, watery. But does anybody else? That's a little confusing to me. I I see that now. I had, you know, I always thought when I looked at this, I've looked at it quite a bit. It, the body position looked awkward to me relative to the head. <laughs> I think maybe you hit upon why that is. But it does look, if you look at his foot, it almost looks like the sole of his foot, doesn't it? Because yes. Looking at it from the rear. Right. Fascinating. His Where body is at? walking away, but his head is facing <laughs> toward you. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard to sort of tell the directionality of the body because it is so sort of, you know, lightly sketched yeah. in to but, the center. Uh -huh. And if you look at his foot on the, his left foot, you can see his toes. I mean, it's a frontal picture of a frontal drawing of his foot. Mm -hmm. See? Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. My, my question was, what about this harsh vertical line, black line that runs up through the, yeah, exactly, that bisects the mm -hmm. entire two thirds of the picture, three quarters. Yeah, what do you make of that? Well, I don't know. And then it's matched by what look like to be almost vines on both sides in the lower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look it's closely at some of those lines. I don't know if we can get a zoom on a little up, like above his head, Christy. Um, it's interesting when you really focus on them. They're almost, to me, sort of drippy, you know, the way they were created. Like the artist sort of very lightly dragged a brush mm -hmm. over the paper. I'm, um, so the sort of corona, um, the figure looks like to me, and let me zoom back out, that it's um, Arabic script. Mm -hmm. Um. And I know that um, mm -hmm. Arabic script is calligraphic and that the, the person who's writing sort of has a lot of leeway oh. in putting flourishes in, this, in the script to make it more decorative. And I'm wondering if maybe some of these drags, and I'm sorry I don't read Arabic script, but are sort of liberties taken um, you know, in creating flourishes, uh, if some of these flowers and hands actually, if we read Arabic script, could actually start to form letters. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these, I think, are very clear to me that it is writing, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering if someone who could read Arabic could maybe see those as, um, um, I forget the word, but it's sort of like ideograms writing that also looks like the thing that is being written <laughs> um yeah sort of like um hieroglyphics but not that but yes something mm -hmm. yeah 
Like if you write um, the word choo choo, it kind of looks like a train <laughs> and uh -huh. you can make it look like a train, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's interesting. All the um, different sort of motifs in here and you see repetition and um, um so what do you think we talked about this figure might be transcending what is do you think that this um artwork is conveying a message or is it really just uh to get us to think about spirituality any thoughts on that To me, it does. Yeah. Go ahead, Billy. Well, the, the, it does because the luminescence of the figure, the glow of that figure, and then the, like you say, wings or whatever is coming out from that figure has, it, for lack of a better term, it glows. Mm -hmm. It's just glowing into we don't know where now if you look carefully at the figure's right hand which is on the left that hand is open yeah that that palm is open walking forward i just i i agree with the transcendence and it's almost like uh i don't know how to explain it it's it's like rising into heaven mm -hmm. maybe that's part of what the black line is is some kind of passageway or door that mm -hmm. he's walking through could be yeah i see that maybe so mm -hmm. how does this one make you feel how does this artwork make you feel i think it's beautiful it's I can't wait to see it in person. I, I could I could look at it for hours. I the detail is fascinating and it is there's a spiritual quality. I think it's incredibly beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's very abstract and that there's a lot to be in like each individual because even the clothes, like the individuals oh. not wearing pants, it appears, or any kind of clothing on the legs. And it's just left to your interpretation or imagination as to where this person is coming from or going to. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a look at the um, title slide a minute. It is called Mirror Plane by Shazia Sikander. And she created this in 2012. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She was born in uh, Pakistan in 1969. She is based in um, New York now and best known for her miniature painting in the Indo-Persian tradition. But she's also a performance artist, a muralist, a mixed media artist, and an installation artist. So she works in tiny, you know, miniatures, but also these huge works. I thought that was really interesting. Um, she was taught the art of miniature painting in the traditional Pakistani technique, but she, as we've seen, puts a real contem contemporary spin on it and projects it forward to the present day. Um, she a lot of times she incorporates the East traditional Eastern ideas of music, text, and scroll painting. Um, she has I have a quote from her. She says, "I'm still going to the same image, but trying to find another way to transform it. I'm not trying to hide where they come from, but they need not be associated with their source. I'm interested conceptually in the distance between the translation and the original." She has won many awards um, and honors. In fact, she received the inaugural Medal of Art in 2012 from um, then Secretary of State um, Hillary Clinton. Um, so anyway, that I just think she has a real interesting history. And I just love the idea of going <laughs> with these really tiny little details paintings and then some of her work starts there but becomes quite large 
Um, this one is, this is actually pretty large too, 36 by 29, it's not tiny. Um, all right, any other questions or comments? I did just want to say to Micah, um, you said you wanted to see it in person. It is uh, up in our collection hall now. I think it will be taken down in March. Our works on paper can only stay up for three months at a time. And this went on view, um, I think pretty late uh, in 2020. So if you'd like to see it in person before it goes back to sleep in the vault for a while, um, it's up now. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And what I wanted to say about what I appreciated by this uh, talk was when we make our wings, our, our hands are at the end of our wings. Mm -hmm. And when I saw this, I thought those were um, feathers. So mm -hmm. I just like the thought of hands at the end of our wings. Like a snow angel, Sandy. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> it is sort of like that. Yep. Yeah. Very much so. I get the sense that this is, when I look at this, more about where this person is going, where this figure is going, rather than where he has been. I totally agree, Billy. Mm -hmm. As soon as you and Terry were talking about the figure below, which I think I honestly probably overlook more often because the top figure, the standing figure, is more articulated. It's mm -hmm. more fleshed out, it's easier to read with your eye, the, the face you can uh, make out very distinct um, facial features, whereas the figure below is just very lightly sketched in. But I, I thought as you and Terry were talking, you know, is this person sort of dead maybe and their spirit is rising mm -hmm. up? Mm -hmm. That's, that's when you guys were talking, that's how I started to see it. It, it has that feel to it, that it could be that. Okay, well, we probably should move on to our last work here, our third work. Um, okay, we'll see, some, may see some similarities in here, but let's take a minute uh, just to look closely at this. Okay, what's going on in this artwork? It's hard to say the meaning. I mean, I see young girls and obviously body parts, feet. I see birds and I see what looks like the moon. And I'm trying to put together the, the young girls and the birds and the moon. Um, okay, well, um, okay, so yeah, we see um, definitely some figures, and um, you mentioned the moon. I think on perhaps on either side, uh, we have a something that looks like it could be the moon um, and the birds. Um, all right, what what else? What else did people see in this? It's, it's kind of like the last one. There's just a lot. There's a lot to take in and wow, it's powerful. There, there is a lot going on. What, when you looked at it first, what was your eye first drawn to? I was drawn to the face of the girl on the right because it's, it's so mm -hmm. large and her hair and she doesn't, she looks almost pensive, but she doesn't look happy. I would say that. And as I'm looking more, the, the figure to her left, um, looks emaciated maybe um okay it looks right. to be a naked child okay somebody think child i should say all right the back of a naked child all right i'm fascinated with the figure um laying on whatever he or she is laying on and i'm also struck by uh, the Positioning of the feet reminds me of the crucifixion. Um, and then just below the feet looks to be, oh, I see, it's, it's another bird. Yeah. 
Micah Jean, I also didn't see that bird at first. It that the bird below the feet uh, came to me very late. Yeah, me too. Me too. At first, I thought it was um, a face. Mm -hmm. The bird underneath the feet, almost mm -hmm. uplifting in a way. What, is mm -hmm. this? what do you see underneath that bird? Because to the left, I see the face of a, it looks like the, uh, a reclined body of a woman, the face of a woman. And I see her legs, I think, to the left or to the right. Uh, but what is that in the middle? Well, that's her. It's the Both. torso of the figure. Mm -hmm. So the child, at least this is the way I see it, but I think that what I'm finding is maybe we're all seeing different things. <laughs> is that so. the child, the new child is sort of facing this figure and that this is just sort of the torso. So here's the uh, stomach, the curve of the hip, the indentation above uh, where your thigh starts and sort of the other legs sort of poking about to sort of start here that maybe comes up and then down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it almost looks like maybe the left leg is raised. And right, and this is maybe like the rib cage, shadow of the rib cage. Mm -hmm. Can you see that, Billy? I, I see it. I don't necessarily agree with it. I don't disagree with it. I just still don't know what it is. And look at the, the nude of the child and the left buttock. Mm-hmm. That too has that same kind of distended, if I could use that word, I think, look as, I mean, these in the center, I mean, those could almost be breasts from hmm. what I see. I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I, so that's, that's why I was wondering what anybody else saw. And these birds are not friendly birds. Mm. Hmm. So oh. I just discovered that the, the frontal bird is um, like a vulture, um, a hawk, a and hawk. then, or a hawk. That's a, that's a hawk, I believe, and then a, a hummingbird. And and I see two hummingbirds, but I don't know if the one to the upper left is a hummingbird. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a long enough beak, but I don't know that. No, I don't think it's a hummingbird. No. Is anyone a bird watcher? On the <laughs> <call>? <laughs> it looked kind of sparrowish to me. I mean, I do not know anything oh, no. about birds, but um, <laughs> it's got sort of a short beak, and so mm -hmm. you know, a, the type of bird that eats berries and seeds. Yeah, mm -hmm. the way they're coming in with their claws down makes it seem scary to me. Hmm. There, I, I'm just going to say this real quickly, and it's not important to anybody, but I don't like this picture. You don't like it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, who, who do you think these people, and, and first of all, tell me why, why, did, why don't you like it? I'm just curious. Um, it's threatening. Okay. It's grim. The child looks possessed. Uh, the mother looks dead. Um, and the uh, lunar spheres in the back, the whole thing is just, is, is kind of, uh, Frightening, and the feet of this figure, while they do have uh, a, a Christ, a crucifixion kind of look, also look like somebody could be hanging. Mm. Mm. Wow! So okay. this is kind of—I'll answer the question right now. Would you like this in your home? No, <laughs> you would not. Okay, we won't. I won't even ask that then. Okay. No one's hitting the birds away. I mean, this bird's on this girl's head and no, this other bird, it doesn't seem to be that anyone, there's no motion, there's no life. It's just kind of like a dead picture, yeah. even though you are led to believe that the two girls at least are alive and no one's swatting the birds or raising their arms. The arms are straight down. I, I agree with Billy. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I don't find it threatening. Um, I'm very curious about the figure on the table. Um, looks very androgynous to me. Everyone's saying that it's a woman, but I'm not I see so it as sure. a man. I thought it was, mm -hmm. I did too. Mm -hmm. Man. Yeah. And um, I'm a bird watcher and I, 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 I don't find 
these birds um, threatening or mm -hmm. aggressive? I mean, I know hummingbirds can fight among each other, but um, yeah, I just find it fascinating. I can't wait to find out what it's about. <laughs> okay, all right. Can I tell you what I made up with this? And I started with the hummingbirds and what is the theme of hummingbirds? And I think their heart moves, beats really, really fast and they move fast. And I thought the theme of this is life is fast. And this is a little girl and it shows her as a woman dead. And it, in the moon to me is the moon really moves quickly. If you watch it every night, it's always moving further and further. So, and I thought the woman had risen, uh, was, you know, now was dead and had moved on. And it's to me is a reminder of life is, is fast and you got to move else a vulture is going to eat you up. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy, I want to, I want to, I want to come after you because, um, <laughs> or follow you in, in your interpretation because I had some similar and some different interpretations. Um, I also thought that this was a male on the table. I don't know why. Um, I saw, I see transcension. I, I think the feet going in the air and the birds representing spirit, whether good or bad um are are a symbol of that transcending and maybe taking taking someone away especially the one that's under his feet under that person's feet you know just kind of mm. lifting and taking them away um the look of distress in the young girl's face mm -hmm. i saw as not being able to bear what what was before her and choosing to turn away and the, and the much younger child, as many of us in our, our younger age, have that fearlessness of wanting to understand. And so I see that child looking on to, under, to try to understand, is this person sleeping? You know how kids have that, mm -hmm. that wonder, what does this mean? Um, but I couldn't, I still couldn't figure out the two moons. So I liked your idea of the, the rapid passing of time, or that life goes on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a wonderful interpretation. Wow, there's so many, <laughs> so many <laughs> different ideas on this, I love it. Um, yeah. Hey, okay. one thing that this makes me think of, um, and no one has said, is in dreams. Mm -hmm. When you're dreaming, mm -hmm. there are a lot of things that in life may never happen. People may not be in the same room together. And things can happen in a dream that make perfect sense in the dream. And if you think about them, they would never happen in life. Um, you know, you might be walking, you know, in the forest, and then all of a sudden you're in your childhood bedroom. And that makes perfect sense in the dream. But, you know, obviously that could never happen. And this to me just looks very dreamlike that, mm -hmm. you know, there are things together in the same space that wouldn't be in real life. Um, at least on earth, we don't have two moons, although I wonder if one is a moon and one is maybe some, and some other heavenly mm -hmm. body. Um, mm -hmm. These birds would probably never be together in the same space. You wouldn't mm -hmm. have a hummingbird and a bird of prey, you know, within proximity to one another. Mm -hmm. Um and I'm wondering if it's the little girl who's dreaming because she's the only one in represented as a figure that has clothes on, mm -hmm. you know, so that sort of sets her apart. She's also more, I think, fully finished in her mm -hmm. representation than everyone else. So mm -hmm. this always like looks so dreamy to me. Um, she really is the only figure including the birds that is looking out towards the viewer. Exactly, Billy. Yeah. Right. So she's engaging you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point, Christy. That it is very dreamy. It does have that quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a look at the um, title slide. Uh, just a minute. Okay. 
um, the title is Icarian Image 3 Nocturnal by S. Tucker Cook. He did this in 1975. Okay, this title, what does, and I, I may not be saying it right, Icarian Image, what might that refer to? It makes me think of Icarus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the myth of Icarus. Who uh, could you tell us a little about that, or what do you remember about that? I I don't remember right now. Okay. Icarus, Icarus something. Icarus rising. Well, it, he did. It, his um, father was is a Greek mythology. His father was Daedalus, and he was the one who created the maze or the labyrinth to you know, trap the Minotaur. And um, as a result, he and his son were in prison because the king didn't want the secret of the labyrinth to get out. So he put him in a tower. And in order to escape, Dadless made two sets of wings, one for himself and one for his son. They were made of feathers glued together with wax. And he, he warned his son um, not to fly too high or the wings would melt. The wax would melt. And he also, and I forgot this part of the story till I looked it up. He also said, don't fly too low or your mm -hmm. wings will get soggy and you will drown. Mm -hmm. And um, so his son very enthusiastically started flying too high, got too close to the sun and his wings didn't melt and he fell into the sea. So um, what, now that you know the title of the of the world oh. change your impression <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to have another conversation? <laughs> oh. I, I, based on the conversation and, and the interpretation, I'm starting to like this better. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, let me, um, I'll just tell you. Uh, just a brief thing about the artist. He's here. He's here in Asheville. He's uh, S. Tucker Cook was um, at UNC Asheville uh, Art Department. He was there starting in 1966, and he retired in 2007. He was head of the department, art department, there for more than 30 years, and um, he works uh, primarily with paint and mixed media, but. One thing I found out, he likes to create a balance of supposed opposites in his work, balancing the real and the unreal, light and shadow. So I think we've got a perfect example of that here. Um, so yeah, it's just other? so beautifully done. It really is. You know, I I love looking at his works in our collection, and I. That those are the only images of his that I'm familiar with, but we do have a fair amount of works by him in our collection. I love looking at them because they're so open to interpretation, but beautifully made mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, any other comments or questions, I guess, on any of these works? Um, Looks like our time is about to run out here, but um, I guess I have one last question for you. Which one of these three more closely aligns with your own view of the human spirit? I, I'd like to be optimistic and say the middle one, the second one. Okay. I agree with Billy. I like the way you worded that, Billy, which is, and when I was wording it, I was like, I want it to be the second one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I just wanted to throw another second thought to the second one. Um, I saw the wings or feathers as blue and white to be American, and the gold body seemed to be spiritual or um, somewhat not quite regal, but something like that. Hmm. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I think our time is up, but I want to thank all of you for joining us today and for your wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it. And um, thank you, Christy, for all your 
um, help in putting this together and your wonderful insights too. Thank you so much, Kay. And thank you everyone for being here today. As always, learn so much when I come. And, um, you know, we don't have usually the opportunity, um, even as staff, to really sit down and be with works of art for 20, 30 minutes at a time. So this is always such a treat. I think that's why you always see both Paige and me here, because we all we get to learn something every time we come um, and enjoy spending time with you. So thank you again. Um, next week, January the 29th, uh, our touring docent Shauna Hill is going to lead us uh, in a conversation. Her topic is observation or hidden meaning. And I think that um, she's chosen three really interesting um, works on paper for us to look at that might mean something uh, to you on the surface, but um, as you delve into them, might have more hidden meanings as well. So join us for that. Um, the um, link is up and running on our website to get registered. I think that Paige usually includes the link for next week's program in her eval uh, email that'll be coming your way uh, shortly. Um, we also have all of the uh, topics for February posted on our website. So if you'd like to check out what we're going to be doing on uh, in February, uh, get that little preview and get signed up. Uh, we would welcome you to do that. We'll also have an email going out to everyone, I think next Friday, with all of the February topics, if you just want to hold on and wait for that as well. Hope everyone has a great weekend, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Okay. See you next time. Bye-bye.